are, oh, let me go back. Sorry about that. There are three main divisions. For those of you that take notes, if you don't have these yet, we are going to see the announcement. Now, that's the part that I told you will be, will be out of sequence a little bit, but uh, it won't be very bad. I'll explain that as we get into it in just a minute. Then we will see the actual arrival. And then tonight we will even take a look at what happened immediately following the arrival of the baby Jesus, the little peasant baby Jesus when he was born into the world and his first visitors, some sketchy visitors. But let's look at the announcement, which is going to comprise Luke 1, 26 through 38. Luke 1, verses 26 through 38 is where we get the announcement. Now, I told you that we're out of alignment just a little bit because what we're about to look at in these verses, um, last on, on Sunday, we looked at Zechariah and the prophecy about John the Baptist being born, and we saw John being born. Well, this episode that we're reading right now, these few verses, actually happened in between the announcement to Zechariah and the actual birth of John the Baptist. So we backed it up a little bit just to look at how this, this, this whole thing was introduced to this young peasant girl who was not even married yet, was still a virgin, and uh, she's told some incredible news. Let's take a look at it here. In verses 26 down to verse 37, so most of it, verses 26 through 37, we are going to call angelic visit. That is going to take us from verse 26 down to verse 37. It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. In the sixth month. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about that. What does that mean? It means in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So I told you on Sunday, if you were here, that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. And John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So six months into that, Gabriel, who, by the way, had made the announcement to Zechariah, okay, He's the same one that comes to speak to Mary. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay? Now, think about this for a minute. Does anybody know, do you remember what, some, some Christmas trivia here, what city was Jesus born in? Anybody remember? In the back, young man, red sweatshirt. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And yet our story opens up in verse 26 in a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So we've got a problem already. We've got to get this young lady who's going to have a baby. We've got to get her in nine months. She better be in Bethlehem, right? So we'll find out how that happens. In verse 27, the angel shows up, verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, the fact that she was betrothed to a man named Joseph, to, to put it as plainly as I can, it was as if Mary was married to Joseph. However, the, the marriage had not been consummated yet. In other words, the two of them had not consummated their marriage through sex. And so they're, they're engaged, they're promised, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's on its way, but it had not been consummated yet. So that's why she's still a, a virgin. And she's betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. He was of the house of David, meaning from the family line of King David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. Now that's some good news. If an angel comes in, and says to you, hey, you're a highly favored one. That's great news. This is starting out really well. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So anytime that the Lord is with you, you are blessed among women. Okay? So if you are one of the young ladies here and the Lord is with you, you are blessed among women. I, would, I think that it's safe to even say, if you're one of the guys and the Lord is with you, you are blessed among men, okay? Anytime that the Lord is with us, we're going to be blessed. But obviously, this, this title or this, these words that he's speaking to Mary 
certainly do um, uh, highlight Mary or, or what God thought about Mary. She certainly seems to be someone special and not just, you know, your average everyday individual. Now, in verse 29, it says, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Now, all these little, all these little uh, clues in here, all these little things that I lock in on, and it might be because my mind is so strange and I just look at all of these things, but I'm going to share some of it with you and maybe your mind is kind of strange too. Verse 29, when she saw him, notice this, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. So it would appear that according to that verse, she was not, now she may have been, but it's not recorded for us. According to this, she was not troubled at his appearing, at the fact that there was an angel standing there in front of her, talking to her. What seems to have troubled her is what he said. What was it that he said? I mean, it didn't sound bad to me. He said, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. What is she troubled about? Now, I do not know for sure because it does not tell us what exactly she was troubled about, but it does say that she was troubled at his saying. So we know that she was troubled by what he said. Now, from what I understand of Mary, not only from this story, but from the, the other accounts in the Gospels and other things that we read about Mary, I wonder, I just wonder, I wonder if she was troubled because he said, highly favored one, and blessed are you among women. Now, the reason I bring that up is because from what I can tell, Mary is a humble woman. There does not seem to me to be a proud bone in her body. She does not seem to be prideful. And so maybe she had problems with him saying, hey, you're, you're highly favored and you're blessed among women. I mean, she was barely a woman herself. Not that she wasn't a female. What I'm saying is it is assumed, it is believed that she was very young at the time. She was not married yet. She hasn't had any children yet. So it seems like she was a young lady and perhaps she's thinking to herself, wait a minute. This is, this is troubling because I don't see myself as being highly favored by anyone. And uh, I also don't see myself as much as it, as, as it compares to other women. I mean, she had visited her, um, her family member, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Godly woman, a godly older woman. Married to a godly man who was a priest. And so maybe when she's comparing herself to the other women around her, you know, uh, Elizabeth, maybe some of the other women that she lived around, she's probably thinking, uh, I'm not blessed among women. I mean, it, it might be that, hey, angel, you, you're kind of making me sound like I'm something more than, than what I really am. But the angel was not lying. The angel was telling the truth. And so she has some kind of trouble with it. And it says in verse 29, and considered what manner of greeting this was. What's, what's going on? What is this all about? Then the angel said to her in verse 30, do not be afraid. Remember, that's the, the, the first thing he said to Zechariah, right? Do not be afraid. We were, you know, we know as soon as he saw the angel, he was, he was terrified. He was afraid. This time, he says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What wonderful news. You found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And then it describes Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. Now there's another little indicator. He will be great. How will, we, how will we know that he's going to be great? How do you know he's going to be great? Well, because he will be called son of the highest. Now notice, he's not going to be called son of Joseph because Joseph, his earthly father, is not the highest. She understands what he's saying here. The fact that he will be called son of the highest means, and she understands this, that he will be called the son of God. So he will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, for a young Jewish lady at the time, and perhaps, 
even many Jews today, to hear this phrase that he will have the throne of his father David would indicate something to her. It would indicate to her that this is the Messiah because the prophet, uh, prophets uh, 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 explained in the prophecies and, and uh, the word of God explained that the Messiah would come through the line of David and would sit on his throne forever. So as she hears this, it's becoming very clear to her who the angel is saying she's going to give birth to. Now she has a hard time with all of this, and we'll see that in a minute. But it says that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, what does that mean, that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever? Does anybody know who Jacob is? What's, what is he talking about? He will reign over the house of Jacob. Anybody know? All right, good, because you're about to learn. So take note, okay? I might ask you later. Who in the world is Jacob? Well, Jacob in the Old Testament, he got into a wrestling match with God. And he got his hip messed up. And he dragged it around for the rest of his life. Because you can't wrestle with God and come out of that unscathed, you know? And so his name was changed from Jacob to, anybody know? Israel. Israel thank you very much. His name got changed from Jacob to Israel. Now, the name Jacob and Israel are synonymous, and you see them throughout the Bible, Just get they get interchanged all the time. When it says that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, it means that this is, this is Messiah. This is the Savior. This is the King of Israel, and obviously we know the King of Kings. And it says in verse 33, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, this is wonderful news for this young lady. But she's going to have trouble with it. She's going to ask, how, 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 how is this supposed to happen? And you'll see it here in just a minute. But this is incredible news. And you might think that, you know, something like this would just, I mean, what, what's her problem? Why is she having trouble? I mean, he just gave her some great news. Why doesn't she just, you know, quit whining about it and just, you know, accept the good news? Well, what if somebody came to you and said, hey, you won a million dollars. Would you just go, Oh, great, thanks. That's wonderful. Or would you go, what? Wait, what? What? How? What are you talking about? I'm, you know, you guys, I'm, I'm 15. I'm 16, I'm 17. You know, I like, what, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean I want a million dollars? What are you talking about? Sounds too good to be true, right? So now we understand how Mary could go, oh, what? Wait, what did you... Did you just tell? Did you just say that I'm gonna have? I'm gonna give birth to the Messiah? What are you talking about? Every Jew would have been waiting for Messiah for lots of reasons, but as we'll see in our next section, specifically or at that time, because of the conditions that they were living in politically, we'll see that here in just a minute. But this would have been hard for this young lady to, to take in. Now, she also has something else on her mind. Let's see what that is in verse 34. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. So she's trying to figure it all out. And I like this. Because I, I, I think, at least for me, it indicates that Mary was practical. Some of you ladies in here, don't raise your hands. I already know the answer. Some of you ladies in here, you struggle with your emotions. Emotions go crazy. Guys? Play it safe. Don't say amen. Don't say, yeah, that's right. Don't look at your friend, you know, your female friend. Don't nudge her. Don't, you know, say like, yeah, you're crazy with those emotions. Don't say anything, okay? Don't say anything. But the ladies all know that the emotions can go crazy, right? The guys have trouble with emotions too, but just not as much as the ladies. Generally speaking, I'm making huge generalizations here. But this is coming from no expert, okay? But, you know, I did grow up with my mom and sisters, and I've got a wife, I've got three girls, so I know a little bit about emotions. A little bit, okay? I'm playing it safe, in case one of them watches this video. <laughs> playing it safe, they're all wonderful, you know? The emotions can go crazy. And, you know, sometimes you young ladies, you might look, you know, you might be your, maybe your mom is emotional, and, you, and, and, and a lot of times, if you have one emotional, uh, you know, spouse, which oftentimes is the lady, 
A lot of times, dad is like super practical. Absolutely the way it is at my house. Things could be going like, it, emotions wise, things could just be like all over the place. And then Pastor Chris is just like this. So what's the problem? <clears throat> what are you crying about? You know, <laughs> I, I, I can be that way just so very practical. And sometimes people get mad at me for that. Like, man, what's, you know, you got to just, your heart's just made out of tar, you know? Like, what's wrong with you? You got no emotions. But, but I'm just so very practical. But, but I'm, I'm saying all that to say this. Look what Mary says in verse 34. How can this be since I do not know a man? Mary doesn't go, oh, 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 oh this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. This is wonderful. She, it, she does not seem to be struggling with her emotions, at least in this minute. What she asks is not, oh my gosh, when can I start buying baby clothes? She doesn't do that. What she does is, okay, wait a minute. How's this going to happen? She's thinking practically. And in verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. In other words, Mary, you're going you're gonna to carry the baby for nine months. You don't... You, the Lord's going to take care of it. The Holy Spirit will take care of it. You don't worry about the Holy Spirit getting the baby into you, okay? You just, all you need to be concerned about is carrying it, okay? Therefore, at the end of verse 35, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. So there's the mention there of Elizabeth. And I, I think I mistakenly said earlier that uh, she had visited Elizabeth already, but she's just finding out. So she gets the announcement, uh, uh, or Zachariah does, then Mary gets hers, and then she goes to visit. So that's the order of events. Now, what we see in verse 38 here is the acceptance of all of this. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. She says, Gabriel, you are looking. When she says, behold, she goes, you're looking at the Lord's maidservant. In other words, let's do it. Let's do it. She says, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I love that, that willingness. Sure, she accepts the task, accepts the job. This is incredible. And she's willing to do it. Now, we move on to our second main division, which is the actual arrival. Everybody's familiar with this. We know the story, and uh, let's take a look at it. In verses 1 through 5, we have a divine appointment. Verses 1 through 5, so now we're in Luke chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 1 to 5 right now, and that's a divine appointment. Now, it says in verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. A decree, a mandate. Who remembers 2020? Oh, right. Mandate, right? This place was empty, absolutely empty. And Matt and I, we were like, well, what are we going to do? I was like, I guess we'll just show up and do some Instagram live Bible studies, worship and Bible study. We did it. And, uh, but the place was empty because it was a mandate can't meet you can't congregate all those kinds of things and then you know then we started breaking rules and showed up and everything just you know has been good since then but 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 listen to this a decree went out from caesar augustus that all the world should be registered okay uh, a census okay that's what's the big deal about that well verse two this census first took place while Quirinius was governing syria so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. You see, in order for everybody to be registered, they had to go back to the city of their birth or the back to the city of their family. Ah, now we've been highlighting in our series called True Light, we have been highlighting the darkness because it is against the dark background that we're seeing all of these incredible uh, events uh, uh, placed. And I want you to understand that the time that they were living in, politically speaking, was a very dark time. We think that we live in dark times. Herod goes on to kill all of the male children. How about that, politically? 
There was no voting like, well, you know, I'll, I'll just won't vote him back in. There was none of that. Caesar Augustus says, hey, I demand that everybody needs to be registered. And that meant that everybody had to drop what they were doing and go back to the city of their family. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And in verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, house of bread, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So there, there it is, a divine appointment. What am I talking about? Well, what God is doing is he's getting everybody in place for this magnificent birth. And he needs to get Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So what does he do? He gets Joseph, the man that she's betrothed to, to go to Bethlehem. Now, some Bible teachers believe that she did not, she was not required to go with him in order to be registered, that it would have been him that had to go and register. I do not know if that's true or not, but she goes with him nonetheless. It may be that she goes, hey, you know, the baby's almost here. You know, you're not leaving me. You're not getting out of this thing. Let's go, you know, and, and uh, off to Bethlehem they go. Or it may be that uh, she was struggling with this whole thing and thought, hey, let's, 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 let's get out of here. Let's get on a donkey. Let's go for a trip. And you know, take a little bit of a break from these things, but whatever it is, now she's, <coughs> excuse me, now she's, she's on her way to Bethlehem, and in verses 6 and 7, we have the delivery. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, because Mary does go on to have other kids after this, Mary and Joseph. But this is the firstborn son. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling claws, baby claws, like a, like a blanket, you know? Some of you, you know, you probably have pictures. Your mom has pictures and she breaks them out every once in a while of you wrapped, wrapped up, man, like a taquito, like a burrito, all tight, you know, in the, in the delivery room or, you know, in the, in the room after and you're just like, you know, little baby right there and all you can see is your face. You can't do anything, just like a little worm, you know? It's like, where, where are my limbs at? You know, just wrapped up tight, wrapped in swaddling cloths. And laid him in a manger. Why did she lay him in a manger? Because there was no room for them in the inn. There was no room. Because it is believed that people were flocking back to Bethlehem for the registration. And there was no room. Strange, you know, if he had family there, why didn't he stay with his family? I don't know the situation and all of that, but... They're, they're, they're staying somewhere where evidently there were animals nearby because she laid him in a manger. That was his first crib. <clears throat> Incredible. Here he is. He's just, you know, the Messiah, son of God, has just been brought into the world, just been delivered into the world. King of kings, Lord of lords. And yet here he is, king without a castle, a prince without a palace. And he's brought forth in this area, wherever these these. This manger was, I'm assuming that there were animals around. And then, and then his first crib is a manger. Put him in a manger, a feeding trough. It's for animals. Imagine that. Some of your moms, don't raise your hand. Some of your moms are germaphobes, right? They're like, no way, man. You know, you don't come in here with those shoes. Don't, you know, you're coughing. Okay, go sleep in the car. You know, like, they're just like, no way. You ain't coming here. You did you, you know, did you, did you wipe it down after you used it? You know, did you wash your hands? You know, they're, they're like, oh my gosh. You know, can you imagine if they had to, you know, they give birth to you where there's animals around, first of all, and then put you in a manger? Come on, forget about it. Now, we move on to our third and final division, which is verses 8 through 20 of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And now what we see here, now we've seen this humble birth, wonderful event, Messiah, Savior of the world, born to a peasant family, birthed somewhere apparently outdoors or something or there were at least animals nearby and then he's placed in this manger and now what about what about visitors you know whenever you have a baby you know you get visitors right you get visitors what about the visitors let's look at it now we're seeing adoration here 
And again, we're looking at verses 8 through 20. In verses 8 through 14, 8 through 14, we are going to see heavenly visitors. Heavenly visitors. Verses 8 through 14. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. One angel stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. You bet they were. Then the angel said to them, here's the angelic message again, do not be afraid. I don't get it. You know, I'm, The angel shows up. I'm terrified. I think I'm going to die. And you say, do not be afraid. Anyhow, do not be afraid. And then he tells them why. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Ah, that's where Linus got it from. Okay. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Good tidings of great joy? Yeah. The Messiah has just been born. And it says in verse 11, he says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Wow. Wow. The fact that the Jews were under Roman rule. Now, they had been waiting for Messiah for a long time. But the fact that they were under Roman rule was even more reason for them to hope in the Messiah. Many of the Jews believed that Messiah would be born, come into the world, and free them from the Romans. He would be a political, powerful political leader who would free them from the Romans, from the occupation. Now, they would find out later on this is not what Jesus came to do. He, was not, he, wasn't, he wasn't here to promote an earthly kingdom. He was all about a heavenly kingdom. But there was great expectation. And this angel is explaining to them, listen, man, uh, there was born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. Now, he's speaking to shepherds. You will find a babe. That's baby, okay? That's not like, oh, there's a real babe over there, okay? That's not what that means. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now, for you and I, we might have a manger scene at home. And we go, well... I don't understand what's so special about this. Like, everybody knows baby Jesus was in a manger. What's, what's, the, what's the problem? You hear what he just said? He just told the shepherds, listen, a baby's just been born into this world. And this baby just happens to be the savior of the world. This is, this is Messiah. Okay? And then he says, you're going to find a baby. He says a babe, a, a baby. Wrapped in swaddling cloths, okay? Nothing wrong there so far. Baby wrapped up in swaddling cloths, that's just normal, right? That's what you do with babies. You wrap them up like a burrito. But then he says, lying in a manger. Now, let me, let me help you understand this. 2023, say that you have some family friends that just had a baby. And mom says, hey, we're going to go uh, visit, uh, you know, our friends or, you know, aunt, whoever. And, you know, she just came, but she just had a baby. And you go, okay, let's go. And, uh, you know, you live in Menifee. So you get to their house and then you're like, hey, you, you know, you knock on the door. You go in like, where's, where's mom and the baby at? And the husband or somebody inside the house is like, oh, uh. She's uh, sleeping out in the barn. Would you think that was weird? Yeah. Yeah, you'd be like, what? Why, why, is she sleep, why is she sleeping in the barn? That's not, that's not what moms and newborns do. They don't sleep in the barn. So when the angel tells the shepherds, listen, there's a baby over there in the city, and uh, you, know, you got to go see this baby, and here's the sign. I'm going to tell you the sign. You're going to find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. And, you know, I, I just imagine the shepherd's like, okay, oh, yeah, there's a baby, uh-huh, wrapped in swaddling cloths, uh-huh, lying, lying where? What? Did you say in a manger? So once they start going through town, it's not going to be hard to find a baby lying in a manger. 
That's not, that was not just a, that's not just a normal thing. People didn't just do that. It's like, well, you know, it's the caveman days. They just did that kind of stuff. No, they didn't do that. So he gives them a sign. It's a clear sign. And in verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel, that one angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, here's what they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. What a song. Wonderful. Glory to God in the highest. They glorified God for all of this. All of these angels show up, a multitude of angels. They can't count them. They don't know how many there are. A multitude shows up, and they all begin to say this, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The Jews would have wanted that, peace and goodwill. Again, they're living under Roman occupation. Herod's in charge, man. Things are not good. The world is politically corrupt, uh, corrupt at that time. They want peace. They want goodwill. They want these things. And uh, what, was the, what was the Christmas song that Matt sang tonight? Anybody remember the opening line? Was it O Holy Night? What did, what did Matt sing tonight? What was it? And, and do you remember how it started? How does it start? What's that? Okay, go on. Anybody remember? What, what is it? Ransom captive, Israel. Ransom captive Israel. Oh. Whoever was writing that song, they probably read the Bible. <laughs> and when they said ransom captive Israel, oh that's what oh that's what they were talking about. See, there was this great hope, this great expectation that Messiah would come, man, and ransom captive Israel. And he certainly would do that, but he was going to do that spiritually. Who was in charge, who was, who was occupying, you know, the Romans and politically and all those things. Jesus really just didn't seem to pay much attention to that. They said, hey, should we pay taxes? And Jesus is like... I don't have any money. Anybody got a coin? And they pulled out a coin, and he said, Who's, whose face is on there? He said, Caesar's. He said, well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what belongs to God. He didn't say, yeah, that's Caesar, man. Let's overthrow him right now. He's like, that's Caesar's, earthly kingdom, whatever. Let him have it. Ha! But give to God what's God's. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And then we finish in verses 15 through 20 with humble visitors. Verses 15 through 20, humble visitors. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, just so there's no mistaking, you know, these were not like hell's angels, man, on, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, Harley Davidson's or something. These guys went back into heaven. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Remember we said Mary sounds like she's practical. I like this. She kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She wasn't like, oh man, uh, where's my phone? post right now what's up y'all I'm just over here giving birth to Messiah she just kept him to herself she just she just kind of just kept it quiet man and it says that she pondered them in her heart she didn't go out proclaiming it she didn't go out announcing it she didn't tell everybody guess what I guess what I just had she just kept these things, pondered them in her heart. 
Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now, two things as we finish. Two things. I'm not going to put these up here. I'm just going to tell you these two things. Number one, this Christmas season, it's not over yet. We're right in the middle of it. So we still have a chance. This Christmas season, why don't we do what Mary did? Why don't we gather all of these things that we're hearing? Just keep them in our heart and ponder them. Consider them. Evaluate and say, you know, I know the Christmas story. How is that? How is the Christmas story affecting my heart, Lord? Lord, if I, if I didn't have the decorations and the tree and the lights and the gifts, could I still celebrate Christmas? And, and let's use that and go, you know what? I love that example from Mary. Let me, just, let me just store these things up in my heart and ponder them. Now, there certainly is, you know, we certainly have the opportunity to proclaim things to the, to the world around us. But as far as you and I personally, let's take these things and go, you know what? Let me really consider this right now. Like what, you know, I mean, I know Christmas. I know the Christmas story. But how is this really affecting my heart? And if I do not get what I wanted on Christmas morning, what will that mean? Will it make any difference at all? Or, or if I get everything I wanted, what's that going to do to my heart? Like, is that going to cause me to lose sight of you, Lord? Is that going to cause me to, 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 to rejoice in those things and not in the reason for those things? Like, let me do what Mary did. Let me ponder these things. Let me think about them. Let me consider them. Let me evaluate my own heart, my own life, the condition of my heart. But here's the second thing as we finish. The first visitors, as far as we know, as far as what's recorded, as far as what's recorded, the shepherds were the first visitors. Now, that may seem like nothing to you, like, you know, my I've got a little uh, a, a manger scene at home, and, you know, there's a shepherd or two there. There's even, I think, a sheep with them, you know, and it's like, well, it's just normal. You know, they just, it's what shepherds did. You know, they just kind of cruised around and looked for babies in mangers, you know, and Okay, picture time, click, all right, you know, it's going to show up on everybody's, you know, mantle or on their piano or whatever, you know, hey, there I am at the birth, you know. Shepherds were known, you can go look this up, fact check this yourself, you can look this up yourself. Shepherds were known for being sketchy. In a court of law, it is said, in a court of law back then, that the testimony of a shepherd was disregarded. They couldn't be trusted. They were known to be thieves by some. They were sketchy people. Oops. And yet they were the first visitors at Jesus, Jesus' birth. Welcomed. They were welcomed. It's a wonderful thing. Because what does it show us? It shows us that Jesus was born... Not just to save the uttermost, but to also save the guttermost. And in here, you know, we're all humble people. We're not the uttermost. We're certainly not the guttermost. Somewhere in between. But this is great news. What this means is that everyone is accepted. Everyone's welcomed. Isn't that great news? It doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl. Doesn't matter what color your skin is, what the your financial status is. Doesn't matter if you're popular or not popular. Doesn't matter if you've been a perfect child or if you've been very much imperfect. Everyone's accepted. Maybe you used to be a thief, like the shepherds. Maybe you used to be sketchy. But you're accepted in Jesus. Isn't that wonderful news? Now, if you, I, I know that most of us in here are already saved. We're already Christians. But if you're not a Christian yet, man, if you're still fighting and like, oh, I don't really want to give my heart to Jesus, man. I don't need that Jesus stuff. Like, you know, you know. Listen, everyone's accepted. 
You can come with all your attitude. He'll accept you. He'll change you. But he'll accept you just as you are. The Bible doesn't teach that you got to clean yourself up. God helps those who help themselves. Mm. God helps the helpless. What you want to do is admit your need for Jesus and go, you know what? No, I need Jesus, man. I don't want to, I don't want to miss Christmas. I don't want to miss Christmas. I want to be, I want to be like the shepherds. Like I want to be, I want to be there. Like I want to, I want to be all about Jesus. He'll accept you. You can come with your questions, your attitude, you know, your, your bad behavior, you know, your whatever, your dark past or whatever you got. Bring it all because the shepherds were welcomed. So certainly you and I are welcome. I was shifty before I got saved. I'm still shifty. Huh. Sketchy. I was a thief. I used to steal stuff like crazy before I got saved. From people, from places I worked at, from everywhere. I used to steal things like crazy. But when I came to Jesus, he didn't say, well, you know, when you, you know, you're welcome to come, but you know, what about the stuff you stole two years ago, you know, at Kmart or whatever, you know, it was like, he's, there, there was, there was none of that. It was, yeah, you're welcome. Come bring all your baggage. And he forgave me and then began to clear my life of all that stuff. And I'm still a work in progress, man. Still a work in progress. But surrender your life to Jesus tonight. Why not? He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the way that you're going to get to heaven. Father, thank you so much for today.